first talk, Primary Geography, uh, London. Um, this is a video to help you plan and support the teaching of your locality in and around London. And today, particularly, we're going to focus on um, Croydon because Shanique, my co-host today, Shanique is from Croydon and Shanique works at the RGS. Hi, Shanique. Hi. Thanks very much for being here and joining us all. So I've got some aims in these um, sessions, which is to support you as teachers in seeing the potential of local area studies, to exemplify what Peter Jackson calls thinking geographically and thinking about geographical concepts. So we're going to be perhaps asking each other some questions and developing some thinking on that score um, and also to help you develop case studies wherever you are in terms of local area field work that maybe can support others and your teachers in school. Uh, but all the time we've got in our minds the National Curriculum for Geography um, that tells us that we should inspire pupils and have curiosity and fascination. So um, the kind of structured conversation, semi-structured conversation that we're going to have today will um, promote lots of curiosity and fascination, we hope. Uh, we also would reference the Ofsted Research Review um, that clearly says that field work is a mainstay of what we do through using maps, through using first hand data gathering as well, using those maps in situ. We can start to develop those connections between processes and location um, because we want to start to present to pupils this spatially organized data um, and get them to think about it, to analyze it and to use that in relation to their knowledge of these geographical processes of, of travel, of migration of um, any other processes that we can think of that we'll talk about today that occur to us in relation to London and Croydon um, because research shows that when pupils learn geographical skills most effectively when they are integrated into the teaching of processes and essentially today what's going to be on the screen is a lot of GIS um, mapping that you can find online because we want to develop people's spatial literacy um, because this helps them to to navigate locally in particular as well as globally and in combining and sharing different sorts of data sets different sorts of maps we should hopefully start to develop some relationships um, between them so that's the kind of agenda for today but ultimately we are going to be guided in our conversation by these questions um, ultimately where is Croydon in London how is Croydon similar or different to other places? And both Shanique and I have good experience of being in and around Croydon. Um, so that helps us, that does give us an extra perspective and that might be something that you as a teacher don't necessarily have. Um, but then the five questions that um, Michael Storm created in 1989 that are so insightful to help us think. So where is the geography? That's ultimately what's guiding our conversation today. So what is this location like? Um, why is it like it is? How is it connected to other places? How is this place changing? And ultimately, what would it be like to live in this place and again Shanique and I have good experience have lived experience <laughs> of that so I'm going to stop sharing that and I'm going to start to share an actual map of Croydon just to kind of get us starting off and thinking and maybe Shanice we start off with this kind of open question to ourselves what is Croydon like and we'll just perhaps talk about that because helpfully when you use Google Maps it kind of highlights where Croydon is and it's quite surprising just just before we started off Shanice and I were saying Shanique and I were saying um, it's quite interesting when you go on Google Maps that you can actually get these kind of highlighted um, yeah. areas perspectives so I mean is is that Croydon to you Shanique would you say yeah that well that was that was the first question I, I was saying is like oh did you put that dotted line in or did it come up by itself but yeah so I think I think that yeah that is essentially Croydon I know that there are parts I'm just looking at the north so you've got sort of Thornton Heath up there that technically I guess is part of Croydon Council um but some might say is sort of an own area in itself so you know as opposed to being from Croydon you take it from Thornton Heath um but essentially that that is that is Croydon again um yeah so we kind of again joked a little bit before we started the fact that Croydon has a bit of a um, um, reputation a reputation <laughs> that's probably the word and and of course I'm not somebody who's from Croydon originally but I think you've been there for quite some time so um, do you know where that reputation 
comes from? I mean, how does a place, because it's a very interesting thing for children to think about. Yeah. We live in a place and it has this reputation. reputation. Maybe they have that idea, maybe they don't have that idea, but do you have any sense of how that comes about? You, you know, it's interesting because I don't, I don't know, I don't know where it, where that comes from. And I guess it depends on who you speak to as well, who who gives it that reputation, because it has that reputation. But who does that come from? Is it people that live, you know, just outside of Croydon that say, well, mm. I'm not, I'm not really part of Croydon, you know, or, um, yeah. And I guess with within Croydon, you've got sort of South Croydon, um, that tends to have a sort of, for want of a better word, sort of a posher feel to it compared to sort of areas in the North Croydon but again that might be that sort of like personal perspectives and I guess it depends on um how you see that from your own from your own point of view um and I guess for children it's interesting what um view they have of the area that they live in Mm. and I guess this this is yeah because because I'm I'm somebody who's new-ish to the area the last 10 years or so and yeah um I was quite surprised by that reaction because I don't know of anywhere from the northwest of England, which is where I'm from, which would have that sort of reputation. Um, I mean, I'm thinking of places like 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 Wigan. Maybe there's a sense because I'm not from Wigan that maybe have a different reputation to where I'm from, which is which is Bolton. But they're not that kind of negative view yeah. Um, yeah. that Croydon clearly has. But I suppose it, it's when you start to zoom out and think, all oh, right, Croydon in its context. Um, well, maybe it's a bit of a pretender maybe it's quite big compared to other parts of south london i mean you have got other conurbations other suburban places as well but probably maybe they're not quite as dominant yeah i mean croydon i know croydon's got one of the largest um youth populations out of all the out of all the london boroughs um it's, it's obviously it's grown you know massively over time um and then like you said in terms of its location it is sort of you can see it you can see there it's not quite London Mm. um but then it's not quite the you know the rural areas of down on the down south so Mm. it's sort of on the cusp it's in the middle so that might have something to do with that quite and and I think this is something we always need to bear in mind when we're teaching this this kind of reputation how does our area seem to us we're an adult we've lived in this place other places probably as well in many cases with many teachers but 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 how does it compare and contrast to others and these are kind of really um big debates I think that children need to tell us that they have heard about or know about um, but then we need to start to get into the practicalities of so what is actually there how do we start to name specific locations because I think if we look at this kind of map as it is you've got some certain dominant features um certainly as somebody who generally uses public transport I would say East Croydon station um yeah. is quite a dominant uh, way that Croydon is connected to the rest of the world it's connected to central London it's connected to the Get coast I know I can yeah. get there I can get beyond, yeah, Gatwick Airport. Um, You've got the tram that clearly comes from Wimbledon and ends up in various places like New Addington. um, Yeah, and And then I guess what you don't have is that you've got the overground now in West Croydon there, but what you don't have is the tube, which is sort of iconic for London, sort of that, you know, the underground system, which Croydon isn't connected to. Um, and so it could be that could be part of its reputation that it's sort of off the map and people see it as, you know, people that do use the tube lines like, oh, Croydon, now we don't go there because they actually can't get there on the tube. Um, it's interesting. Just this morning, I read something online that there's a consultation out from Transport for London at the moment to have some sort of circular fast bus service that oh, will connect yeah, I've places. Read that. Have you heard it's about like that? Sadiq, I can't quite... Sadiq Khan's plan. Yeah, I think it Yeah, was. it's a great yeah. idea. So yeah. to have buses that don't stop at every stop and maybe connect some of these outer yeah. London suburban places. I think they're talking about Croydon to Bromley. I think mm. that was one of them. Um, and then right to got, Kingston. Yeah, they've got two already. They've got one that goes to Heathrow yes. uh, and they've got one that cut the X, is it the X68? I think it is, that goes into central London. Um, I get, yeah, I think it stops a little bit in Croydon, but then it's sort of like a fast service straight into central London, which is, you know, it's a cheaper route of getting there and a quicker route than, you know, getting on a bus that stops at every stop. So, And when and when you said fast growing, when you said uh, kind of clearly having to house that 
bigger, younger population. Would, mm. would, would you say the fast growing areas are the centre, the kind of city centre um, areas or, or are there other places yeah, that are I mean, I, as well? I mean, I personally can't remember seeing sort of the East Croydon area without sort of building works going on. It's oh. just, every, you know, I've never seen it. I can't remember seeing it without having, you know, uh, cranes there, you know, building work because it's you know there's a lot of flats going up so if you yeah so we're here now we're in East Croydon are we just is that the yeah. tram stop yeah um lots of office I mean you can even see in this and I know this is 2017 I think these images mm. are from uh on Google there uh office blocks um flats yeah and you can start to see some of these newer buildings um yeah oops um shooting up certainly around the station the view from the mm. station itself is quite quite different um five five years on certainly post post pandemic um but but, the, but then then you've got those kind of iconic kind of 60s 70s buildings like, yeah like that one in particular that is one i think that was the really 50 really pence dominant. shape they said that was i've heard that, that, that before student uh, teachers talk about that yeah yeah um but yeah i think there's something really powerful with looking at maybe this particular location through through the years if we go back to say 20, 2012 and there's some aspects which have changed quite a lot others quite changed lot. less um let's see if we can zoom yeah. around a little bit and i think even just going into croydon with students like you know or, you know students that li or that go to school in around, in and around croydon may have go to the shopping center and they you know they can look up and see these sort of tall high rise you can see the difference there I think that is the Remarkable. that might be the Lego there was one that they referred to as the Lego building or mm. was it Lego they, there's a name for it um, and I think it might be that one and then they've got a is it, I forget all the names now um, there's another one that's quite tall that's near West Croydon um, again it's just a lot lots of skyscrapers I mean you saw it there the difference and then this is obviously housing people, offices as well. So there's clearly changes there which are more major in the centre of this particular locality. And then there are places which have changed a little bit less um, because, as you suggested, towards the south of Croydon, there's a lot more suburbs. There's there's green parks which have been protected, mm -hmm. which have been saved, which have been um, yeah, not not built on because they're um, run by the council, or maybe they're areas of nat natural beauty and so on. Um, and and there's a lot there's a lot more of that that you would find perhaps towards the outer London boroughs compared to some other other yeah. places as well. So it's worth worth having a good play with Street View. Yeah, I think this is really good. I think being able to go back and look at the years is interesting. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a great way of sort of looking at the difference between now and then, and thinking about you know just obviously the physical environment's changed in terms of more more buildings but what about the you know the social environment how is that how may that have changed you know encourage students to speak to their parents about that so this is just a different view um it's always useful when you're using mapping with children or you're preparing for teaching because a lot of this really conversation is about how do you prepare for teaching to find the geography where is the geography in a particular mm -hmm. locality um, so how do we answer some of those storm questions what is this place like how is it connected how is it changing and why and certainly some of the story can be through street view time machine function that you've seen already can be through just scrutinizing the map and just looking at some of the um, green spaces and how they've been kind of protected and changed over time um, but but I mean in terms of a general story of Croydon like like we've kind of mentioned you've got this kind of area in the south which is particularly green which is particularly suburban you've got semi-detached and detached houses um, you've got um, social housing on the hill I mean the new Addington estate is quite an interesting um, example of a kind of mm. um, series of kind of crescents there um, going out from a kind of central parade, a central point. Um, and you often hear that Croydon, as an example, is based on seven different hills. And clearly this is a whole hill that was just in the 1960s, 70s, just decided that they would build this kind of area of social housing and just um, put it arguably 
quite a to remove from the rest of Croydon on yeah. presumably what was farmland um, before. It's actually called North Downs Park, what would have been uh, probably quite a picturesque place until um, the housing estate came there. Um, certainly knowing some of the schools around there, it's quite interesting to see the sorts of um, perspectives that you get. I mean, you really do feel like you're in green. Yeah, it is really green there, yeah. Um, places that are separate from anybody else and and it's only with the coming of the tram really that maybe arguably these places feel a little bit more connected with the rest of mm. um the world because otherwise they are really quite cut off and other than an airport other than some higher places um you've just got golf courses really you've just got woods quite kind of green protected areas yeah so, so we've talked a little bit about how these places changing and the connection to other places. Um, arguably Croydon's coming up in the world um, again compared to what it used to be in terms of the plans that it maybe had in the 60s. I think some of these speculative tower blocks that you see there, the kind of highway through the centre, the underpass, um, had a kind of vision of the future which was around the car and maybe now it's not around the car so much. We're trying to moderate some of those um, big um, kind of concrete intrusive buildings there um, and then of course there's the whole story of shopping isn't there I mean you can see some of the shops there in the centre yeah. um, there, there was a big plan wasn't there Shanique in terms of um, yeah. is Croydon going to get its Westfield centre yeah yeah that was that was uh, in the plans and I think even when that was sort of announced and there was a change in terms of you know people buying you know property in the area to you know because they thought you know, Westfield was going to encourage more people to sort of live in the area, the office, the office blocks again. Um, but yeah, the Westfield obviously hasn't gone ahead, uh, which has left a lot of shops actually moved out of Croydon to make way for the Westfields and they haven't returned. So there have been a lot of shops that have closed down um, in, this, in, this, in the centre, which has been quite a shame because, you know, the closest, I think the closest shopping centre away from Croydon would be probably Bromley, which is quite far out. Um, especially for those that don't drive. So, um, so yeah, I think that's had a big impact on the shopping centre itself. Mm. Because, because I mean, we, we often talk about shopping and think, oh, yeah, we haven't got our M&S anymore. We haven't got mm. this department store or that department store. But it's also those other services that maybe are in a central location, like it mm. could be a bank. It could be something to do post with the office. NHS, yeah. post offices, that when we think about other people in our community, and that's something that right from the early years needs to be talked about, who is in our community? What does our community need? And yeah. clearly at different ages and different stages of life, people need different things different I mean things. when you ask young yeah. children they often say we want more playgrounds we want more swimming pools we want more things for us and that's that's great to hear that great to hear mm -hmm. that kind of context from them but it is useful to sometimes think yeah but what do your grandparents need uh, their needs yeah. are very very yeah. different and if we're going to have this kind of sense of a location that's for a range of different people and not just segregated for certain age groups and certain types of people then it might be you need more um, of certain types of things I often go back to the um, ways that quite often around the country but also in London certain spaces which are kind of derelict and left um, are often used and co-opted by younger people and it's interesting if we talk about um, Croydon itself as having quite a young population um, can you think of any skate parks can you think of any areas that are used extensively by um, people on skate, are... skateboards um, I can't I can't think to hand of skate park. I know yeah no not not off the top of my head I'm trying to think I know they've I know they've um put a lot of paving around Fairfield Halls now and there seems mm. to be a lot I know there's been sort of a lot of I've seen a lot of people roller skating around that area uh, sort of Fairfield Halls near um, Croydon College mm. um and the way they've landscaped it is allowed for that um, yeah so it's that active thought by the people who make these decisions yeah. that we maybe get children to think about um yeah how has this place been um, changed and developed to suit all members of the community um because yeah it may be people who've got wheelchairs it may be people who um, have got poor mobility it may be people who um you know want to have space to hang out with their friends i mean the weather's not always supportive of that in this country but actually perhaps more than yeah. other people, younger people like to spend that time yeah. being outdoors and don't like to necessarily be 
cooped up inside and, and frankly where is there in a modern town or city that is suitable for younger people I yeah. mean they just generally aren't aren't the spaces and I think it's that. about safe spaces as well like in terms mm. of thinking about you know is it well lit is it you know is it easy accessible from you know to get to by bus and you know if if needed um yeah it is really important um so we talked a little bit about Croydon in general but it's certainly in one of the initial powerpoint slides i mentioned kind of patterns and processes so you've obviously got a pattern of um inner city central business district kind of development and and change mm -hmm. and perhaps less change out in the suburbs um less less change in terms of the built environment but are, are, mm -hmm. are there other changes that you think we should perhaps look for i mean you mentioned the interesting idea of kind of social spaces or so social change or how places feel um but yeah. have you got any kind of insights into that and how yeah um i think croydon's croydon's um for those that haven't been it's i, I feel like it's a very diverse area in terms of people from you know different, different ethnicities backgrounds religions mm. um there's lots of different sort of religious places you know, there's a, a big, there's Croydon Mosque, uh, which is opposite the hospital, one of the, you know, the main hospital there. And uh, it's quite, you know, lots of people, especially on a Friday, Friday afternoon, Friday evening. Um, so, yeah, it's very, very diverse in terms of the people that live there. Um, and it would be interesting, I guess, for children maybe to think about about you know what they see when they you know on the buses or what you know when they're walking to school how diverse the area is mm. yeah and it's it's unpacking that because there is a sense of um i'm not them or they're not me or my family doesn't do that and there is a job sometimes of a primary teacher particularly to um to ask them about that to say what they're seeing to ask them how it makes them feel but also then to try and get children to talk to each other in the class and say oh no that's what my family does every Friday, yeah exactly Saturday, sunday exactly. Or whatever what, whatever that particular activity is because that is intimately tied into their personal geographies that's ultimately tied into how their lives operate yeah. beyond the kind of uh, kind of leveling that you have in the classroom every child may be dressed in a similar way you, you may think because of their ethnicity you may think because of what you think about their yeah. kind of cultural uh, geography that they're, they're similar but actually when you start to investigate this with children and you yeah. give that child a sense of agency and a yeah. willingness to listen to them then sometimes it can be really valuable to kind of um tap into that a little bit yeah it's yeah and I'm, i think even just thinking about i know you spoke about processes there so process of so, so sort of migration and mm. you know how did how how do you be, how did you get to be in croydon you know it might be that they've recently moved to croydon or it could be that their family's been there for a long time or you know they've moved from somewhere else within the country or somewhere else within the world and you know why croydon it it might be because they you know that was that was maybe the only option for them it might have been a choice because of the community that's there and them joining the community of um you know maybe they've got family links there and their parents decided to move there or it could you know that it's about thinking about what has led to Croydon becoming this diverse this diverse place because mm. it's worth worth even just looking at a map like that and saying right children where can you see us connected to the rest of the world just mm -hmm. in that kind of um i don't know small area of um the west of croydon and you've got oh you've got wing yip superstore oh i wonder what happens there i wonder what they sell there oh it's a chinese supermarket okay so mm -hmm. especially for people who want to eat or um, experience chinese products or oh, euro car parts you've got mm -hmm. turkish um restaurant there um, so yeah. it's this kind of again it's the, the whole point about these videos is it's all about planning can you look at a map critically and say right how are we connecting to um what is on that local high street what is being brought to the area from the rest of the world both in terms of the kind of human capital the human people but also the different products that are coming and going yeah. uh, and it could be the car what's what, what's the journey of a bmw car yeah that's the that's <laughs> um, sickest one it's yeah. just fascinating isn't it toyota's oh that's a japanese con company children children may know that and actually that's pretty good to start to get them to yeah. label and name that um and and it's, it's the kind of all the different street names as well will have a reason why they were named as they are yeah. and sometimes yeah. again patterns and processes is often a pattern to how certain places were 
uh, named. I mean, you've obviously got some here to do with royalty. Um, you've got some yeah. that could be a kind of road to somewhere else. Um, a Cooper road that could be to do with an old um, job. Now, what, what do Coopers do? Are they the people who shoe horses? Is that is that Cooper? Um, possibly. Um, yeah. Violet Lane. Well, I just wonder maybe they named that because there used to be a lot of violets down there. I mean, sometimes you can work these things out. Um, sometimes it's obvious. Um, yeah. Um, sometimes it's not. Um, but but again, it's worth uh, looking into all of that when you're trying to um, work out because ultimately it's the story. What is the story yeah. What's of the story your behind? locality? Yeah. Yeah. Um, One thing because... I will mention specifically for Croydon, but maybe for other areas, is that in the library, Croydon Library, they've got a um, like a museum of Croydon within the library so there's a lot of mm. sort of history in there that might be a good place to start your local library the area that you're in might have or maybe a community centre might have some sort of history into you know why you know the park was named that or who lived in that area you know how many years ago um that's always interesting I guess you've got the cross cu cross curricular links there with history as well Absolutely right. Yeah, I, because it's tapping into those more knowledgeable others, whether that is in with your particular school, because maybe that is the parents, as we've said. Yeah, the, I think the parents is yeah. a great, great I mean, resource. Because we mentioned the children, don't we? So it's, so it's the children, it's, it's the parents, it's the school governors, it's the wider community. And then it's those other things within the local area, like you say, the museums, um, just going along there maybe on a weekend or after school or on the school holidays and trying to see what that um, specific set of displays can offer you, but also the local archives. Mm. Archivists, from my experience, if you go up and say, can I see a map of, you'll very quickly start to get into a conversation of what <laughs> and where and when and tap into their knowledge because often there are local history societies there are local societies to do with geology that may well um, have a bank of resources yeah. newsletters past recordings of videos increasingly yeah. that you can kind of excerpt little bits on because ultimately it's about your subject knowledge that's what a lot of yeah. this kind of rethinking before you teach um, and that's why teaching local area studies is so tricky and so hard because you need to do a lot of kind of legwork whether that's on the screen yeah. or actually in your locality uh, but once you've got that bank of resources it's there once you've got that bank of resources it's something that you can keep on drawing upon and adding to and again from my personal experience once you tap into some of these local societies and clubs that have arguably sometimes often retired people in them they have a little bit more time and they can sometimes do guided walks for you and all sorts of things to kind of help 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 you out um one one nice question and i like one nice question i like to ask to um people is what what do you think the oldest part of the town is and certainly croydon mm. is quite a good example of that um any idea shanique what what you'd argue i don't know i don't know um i don't know specifically for croydon i know i know fairfield halls um was sort of created around the there was sort of fairs that used to go on um in the past and that's where the, the name Fairfield Halls came from oh. I believe um but yeah that would be you know there's sort of the Surrey Street Market which is quite popular and they've been there for many years too but even just thinking about the shopping centre and you know when when was that created you know where where did that start and how is it developed because obviously it's grown over time with the development of um other parts of it yeah, I think it is that kind of going to the places that you're teaching about at the weekend, because those markets in particular are bustling at the weekend. It's like if we ever go to the East End of London with student teachers, take them to the East End on a weekday and it's quite quiet and there's a few shops open even now that it's been gentrified and changed out of all recognition it's still not quite the hustling and bustling place that tourists go to that mm. people go to at the weekend so I think it is the kind of images that you can take yourself it is the kind of sense of place that you get when you go to a place on foot at the weekend maybe shoot a bit of video I mean I'm a big fan of these devices that we've got in our pockets that we can just kind of shoot that video and then play that back what is it like when we visited it on the weekday um, when we did our surveys and we asked the odd person who was hanging around but then at the weekend this is the hustle and the bustle of these particular places places then yeah 
Yeah, and I guess it's also really good, I guess, to speak if depending on the age of the students that you're working with, maybe speak to them about, you know, what, what areas they encounter on a weekly, daily basis, be it, you know, it might be religious places that they have to visit or it might mm. be specific shops that they go to on a regular basis or areas where they, you know, go on the weekends because I think it's important to get sort of a sense of place from them, from their perspective. I'm just, just taken with the patterns that I can see here because I know this park a little bit and the fact that the River Wandle just seems to appear and then disappear. <sighs> and and it has been opened up quite a lot in the last few years. The River Wandle is not this kind of concrete, canalised channel that runs through. But it's just fascinating that children might look at that and think it's a pond. How can that possibly be a river? But where on earth does the river go? I mean, there's a whole investigation there, isn't there, in yeah. terms of where the river starts and where the river ends. And that one in particular is quite an interesting one. But 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 we don't treat the kind of physical geography of our um, urban spaces perhaps like we might because we've just prioritised the building of tramways, the building of um, roads, the building of uh, buildings and so on. Um, OK, so we're reaching the end of our kind of conversation together. We've kind of covered all sorts of different um, aspects there. I'm just going to go back to our kind of storm questions. Um, I suppose the first question we haven't quite answered, the ones from Marcia Foley in 1999, where is it and how is it similar and different to other places? If you were put on the spot, Shanique, and asked to kind of say, so where is Croydon? What would your simple explanation be? Then? Well, I'd, I'd say South London. I'd say, so, yeah. I'd say, I'd say the South of London. Um, I think everyone has that whether you're from the UK or not you have that idea of London and it just being I guess that makes it feel like it is part of London by saying that um but those that live in London might see it as not being part of London but yeah that's what I'd say and I would advocate you using different sorts of maps as well it was fascinating again when we were just doing a few minutes prep beforehand and we went on to Microsoft Bing and typed in Croydon and it didn't even bring <laughs> up our Croydon it yeah. brought up a different Croydon and, and I just love the children the fact that they can then start to form those kind of connections all oh, right so there's another place named after where we live and this place is very different i mean yeah. when you look at it on a 1 to 25000 map i mean nothing much stands out other than this kind of medieval village so maybe this croydon is the original croydon maybe people from that croydon came to our croydon and made our croydon who, who knows? knows who knows um, but i mean the contour lines and the single pub and the kind of uh, official walking route that's on there all those things you can uh, kind of it's, it's often quite nice to take a single kilometer square and then compare that to another single kilometer so square in, yeah mm. so that's quite yeah. a nice um, strategy um so i think we've answered the other questions what is the place like uh, i mean we've not talked a great deal about um water other than um the river wandel itself but You'll notice on one of the previous maps, there are definitely some um, reservoirs. Um, there are some much bigger kind of spaces um, that water is stored or moved around. Um, there's the whole Beddington um, sewage treatment works. That's quite an interesting part that, again, every locality will have those kind of areas where uh, water is processed and that's quite big areas aren't they they're, they're quite hidden areas from view but it's only when you see them from above that you think gosh we only have clean water because of these yeah. um, really precious places that help to uh, filter our water uh, but as you can see it's really good to look at the same place through different eyes through different um, perspectives through the um, different maps you can find online um, quite, quite quite a fan really of open street map uh, which is this particular um, one. Um, so I think we've talked about how this place is connected to other places. I think we've talked about how this place is changing. Um, and yeah, we really did touch on, didn't we, the kind of affective domain at the beginning. How would it feel like to live in this place? I would certainly give a positive view of mm. being um, a Croydon resident. Shanique? Yeah, no, me too. I, yeah, me too. I, I, I do really enjoy being in Croydon. And um, yeah, I like the diversity and I don't, mm. I, I think that 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 sort of gives it I think it's been it has been named as a sort of cultural borough um you know the the, the culture events and things that are going on over the summer yeah, so, yeah. 
Great. Well, Shanique, it's been really good to spend some time with you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, I'm just going to share a couple of extra slides just, just at the end. And then I know you've got a little bit of news for us as well from the Royal Geographical Society for anybody else who wants to connect with, with them. It's nice been it's been nice to share some time with you today. Um, so I'm just going to share this and then we will we will finish. Um, so here we go. Um, so this is this is who I am. If you're not sure who I am and the sorts of things that I've been up to and where I work, and I would always recommend that you join um, the Royal Geographical Society or the Geographical Association as a member. Um, there's lots of member benefits, but there's also lots of things that are available for free. Uh, certainly, I have a good group of colleagues who help to produce Jog Live um, on a very regular basis. A whole range of different perspectives there on teaching the primary curriculum. And Shanique, you yourself also put on free events as well for teachers who might be interested. Yes, we do. Um, we've got events on for uh, geography or primary school teachers that uh, teach geography. We've got one on the 19th of April, which is called um, What is a Country? So it's sort of looking at um, how you can sort of speak. It's designed mainly for sort of year five and year six, but having them think differently about sort of global governance and specific particularly looking at um, unrecognised um, states like Kurdistan, Somaliland, Taiwan, Tibet, and so discussing how, you know, how you can bring those into the classroom and discuss those with um, students in your school. And that's a free event, and that's on the 19th of April. Great, and details are available online? Yeah, so if you go onto rgs.org forward slash teacher CPD, um, all our events are listed there and you can um, sign up to those, the, the ones that are free. Some of them are paid for, um, but a lot of the events are free and that particular one is, you can sign up online. Thanks, Shanique. Great to be with you. Perfect. Thanks, Anthony.